He has been pursuing me my whole life. At first, I did not know what he was doing, but now I know. Sometimes I wish I wasn't an ex-Muslim. I've always felt like a stranger in a strange land. I was born and raised a Pakistani Muslim, and we spent our lives connecting to a God on a mat. Then one night, everything changed. I met him, and he changed my life. Not just mine, but also my family's. This has been an amazing journey of coming out of what I used to be into the person I was created to be. I came to Jesus before I came to Christianity. I came to the cross before I came to church. This story is about how God pursues us and is calling us to live the life that his son died for. Psalm 27 says, when you said, seek my face, my heart said back to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. My hope is that each one of us would have the courage to seek him and allow him to shape the person he created us to be. It is so good to see you. How are you guys? Man, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, you guys are the best looking church. <laughs> Seriously, it is so good to see you guys. Those of you who are watching by camp, on campus, it's good, uh, it's good to be seen by you. Yeah, it really is. And uh, can you, can you give, make, them, make them feel welcome? Let's do that. Let's just go crazy for them. So glad. Woo! We love you guys. Love you guys. You know, it feels like home. It really does. Every time I come back here, it feels like I've never left. But it is uh, so awesome that I get to share my story because you're part of my story. And those of you who don't know if you're new here, I think I need to re reintroduce myself to you. And, and uh, the first thing you need to know is that English is not my first language. I'm an immigrant, a bilingual immigrant, I speak four languages. And, and so I've realized that English is a little hard, just a little. It is, it is. There's certain words I just can't say. For example, this word right here. Scroll, right? Did I say it? Scroll? Scroll. I said it, right? Okay, some of you guys know this because you maybe know me, but I actually re did not know I couldn't say this word until, until one day I was, in fact, I was in Mount Pleasant. Ashley, my wife, and I, our first apartment, and apparently what happened is that in the middle of the night, some scrolls had found their way, okay, <laughs> focus, had found their way <laughs> from the outside into our bedroom wall, and they were throwing parties every night. And so it got crazy one night. I got up, I started banging the wall, trying to get them to shut up, and it wouldn't happen. And so my wife was like, hey, listen, you got to go complain. And I was like, I got this. So the next morning, I walk in to the office, right? <laughs> yes. And there's a woman there. She turns around, and she goes, hello. She's British. And isn't it true, though, that like with British people, you want to talk like them, don't you? Like you really do. And so I go, well, hello to you too. She goes, well, what seems to be the problem? Like, well, we have a serious scroll problem. <laughs> and then I realized, and she goes, you have a what? And that's when I realized, oh, I can't say this word. So I just kept on saying, we have a scroll problem. It's a serious problem. You need to look into that. And we need to, you need to do something about scrolls. And she goes, scrolls? I said, yes, yeah, scrolls. <laughs> scrolls, like, Tree rats, we have a serious <laughs> screw problem. Fix it, lady. And then I kept on saying that for a couple of minutes and until she said, well, well, we'll see what we can do about that. And I was like, well, all right then. And so I left. And I'm telling you, I'm, I, the face, her face was like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'm going to fake it. And so uh, I tell you that because those of you who don't know me, maybe, um, you might leave here wondering, what in the world was he saying? And so I don't want that to happen because I believe that God wants to speak to us. Not j those of you who are in this room, but those of you who are, who are watching, listening. Uh, you're here really because you need something that I don't have. You need uh, God's whisper uh, to penetrate your soul and your mind. And you're going through some stuff 
this week and there's nothing I can do to help. But I do know that if we can create an environment, then maybe you can hear him and that he could breathe life once again. And so let's pray together. And let's see what God wants to do. Lord God, I thank you. I thank you for your presence. God, what we're doing as we gather together week after week is, is that we're allowing you to move into a context, not space, not a physical building, but we're allowing you to invade our hearts and our minds and our souls. And I'm fully aware, God, that this morning there are people that need a whisper. They need something that they've so so tried to attain other places. They need your words. And so, God, would you speak to us? Would you fill fill the space? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let me ask you this. Have you ever wondered if you're really living the life you were created to live? Ever just stop and go, you know what? I think my life could be better. (laughs) I think I'm not really living the life I was created to live, I I was meant to live. Isn't it true, though, that intuitively we live in this, um, this gap between the current life that we're living and the life we want to live? Like in our minds, there is a life that we want to live, and it's epic, and it's great, and it's wonderful, and we hear about the possibility of it, and there's something inside of us that says, yes, I want that. There's something inside of us, regardless how old we are, if you're in middle school or if you're an empty nester, it doesn't matter. There's something inside of you because you were created with this, this idea that maybe, just maybe, I need to live more. There's a bigger life for me. There's a life that was created to live. And so sometimes we find ourselves in a place where we realize that the, that we're, we're, the things that are defining us are, are that describe our lives are, are not the things we really want to become. We want to become something more. Have you ever seen someone else's life and thought, now I want to do that? Right? You have, right? You, you've probably looked at people's stuff even and said, I want that. Right? Have you ever thought that? You've thought, I want I want her. And then you get, you have her, and then you're like, I want to give her back. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Just joking. Just joking. But we do, we do. We live in this gap between what could be and what should be. The question is, what shapes us? What empowers us? What enables us, sets us free to live the life we were created to live? Is there such a thing? I believe there is. I believe nothing can shape you into the person you were created to be other than God's love for you. God's powerful and unfailing pursuing love is the only thing that sets us free to to live the life we were created to live. Empowers us to move us out of the person we were into the person we were created and meant to be. The reason why I say this is because that's my story. My story is about this God that I did not know that started pursuing me and my family and he kept on pursuing me and kept on pursuing me and now he's taken me out of the person I was maybe born into and into the person I was really created to be. You see, I, I have two brothers and two sisters. We lived in Kuwait. We were actually Pakistanis. And so we lived as immigrants there. And, and um, life was good. But in 1980, the late 80s, my brother, older brother, got accepted to a college in the U.S. And we were really, really excited. But he got accepted to Spartanburg Methodist <laughs> University. Right. We had no idea what Methodist meant. We're like, America. That's awesome. <laughs> you know, we're like, yeah, it's great. Send him there. And so he shows up to this university, has this crazy experience with Jesus, comes back the next year, and uh, he tells me and my brothers and sisters that he is a Christian. He's going to follow Jesus. He's going to tell mom and dad he's no longer a Muslim. And he's like really bold about it. And I basically react, 
I grab his neck, pin him to the wall, and threaten to kill him. Yeah, not a good moment for me. Um, but I, I couldn't believe that he was going to do this. Because in Islam, you, you just don't all of a sudden believe something else. It's, it's more of a nationality than a religion. And so for him to say that, he was going to destroy our family. He was just basically rejecting everything uh, of our tradition. He was doing something that was far beyond changing his belief system. It was bigger than that. So it was very emotional, very intense for me. And from then on, I did not want anything to do with my brother. So in 1990, a couple of years later, Iraq invaded Kuwait. If some of you guys remember, the Gulf War took place. My family and I, we were stuck in the Gulf War. In 1992, we got a chance to leave. I got a chance to leave. And so I was really looking forward to coming to the U.S. I really, really was. I knew my brother was kind of like this Jesus freak, psycho, crazy guy. But I was really looking forward to the U.S. You know why? Blonde people. <laughs> I mean, blonde women, not really the dudes, but not into that. But, but I, was, I was so excited. But you know what, ironically, you know where I landed? I, came from, I went from Kuwait all the way to, I uh, landed in Miami, Florida. Right. They all look like me in Miami. And so <laughs> I show up, I'm like, this is the wrong country. I think we made a mistake here. This cannot be America. And so I was told later on that, um, that, uh, yeah, that it is a part of the U.S., and, but the white people live in South Carolina. And so I finally, I finally made my way to South Carolina, where all the blonde people live. And so, so I show up, right? I show up, and I'm thinking my brother's going to be like, oh, Jesus this and Jesus that. He does not do it. Does not do it. I mean, you can ask him. He's in the crowd right there. And so... He shows up and he basically just invites me to FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And I'm like, I don't know about this. And then he says, there are blonde women there. I'm like, sign me up, man. Let's do this. And so I start showing up to FCA in the back, watching people, hearing the messages. And I'm thinking that like some of you guys are thinking here or there. You're thinking this whole Jesus thing is absurd. I mean, come on, really, really. I mean, this idea that God is our father, he sent his son Jesus to have a personal relationship with us, that God is personal, intimate, and he wants to have a connection with us day to day kind of seems narcissistic. I mean, come on, come on, you were not that good, right? I mean, and so I just thought, like, th that whole idea was ridiculous. In fact, I would mock people. I would have arguments with people. But Mahmoud didn't say anything. But at one night, we were walking um, downtown Charleston, and we got into an argument. And, and I said, you know, the whole idea is just stupid, man. And I remember telling him, like, okay, so you're telling me that Jesus and God is so real that he'll come down. If I, sh if I just ask him to reveal himself, he'll do it. And I remember walking by this bush, and I said, so you're telling me that I can just tell God to come and burn this bush, and he'll do it. So I was mocking him. And you know what he did? He goes, you know what? If you ask him to reveal himself, he'll do it. And I was like, you're an idiot, you know? That's what I thought. So the next time I'm at FCA, I'm in the back, and they're ending in prayer. And so I'm like, okay, you know what? I want to do this. I want to do something. So what I do is I, I kind of go, I go, I look up, and I go, so, if this is even half true, like, I want to know. I want to know. I, re I, do, I do. But it's not true, is it? I'm talking to myself, right? Okay, that's it. All right. That was it. That was it. That's my, that was my prayer. Now, three days later, though, everything changed. Okay, this is where the story gets freaky. Okay, can you say, can you say freaky? Freaky. Oh, good. You're doing a good, a good job. Okay. Okay. It really does. It really does. So three nights later, I'm in my room trying to fall asleep. I'm about to shut off the, la the lamplight. And um, all of a sudden, I feel like something has entered the room. Can't explain it. It felt like death, evil, dread entered the room. My body begins to react to something I cannot physically see. And I'm, I'm, I'm freaking out, but I don't know, understand why. I'm confused as well as I'm... Uh, fearful as I look around, feel like things are moving, but I can't really see them. As I'm trying to understand what's happening, something grabs my shoulders, drags me, and pins me to my pillow. I flip out. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get up. Something sits on my legs. Now I'm paralyzed, 
and the only thing I can move is my neck. And so I go back and forth. I'm going, what's going on? And then I do what any person would do. I cuss in every language I know. <laughs> and, so, and so now I'm like screaming bloody murder. I'm hoping my brother would hear me. But the door opens up and in walks this. I, I told you it was freaky, right? So in walks this demon thing. Okay, now I'm a Muslim. Like I'm not even into demons. Or vampires or werewolves. I'm just not into that. And so, so this thing walks in. I'm thinking, wrong room, bro. Like, this is this. I'm not, I'm not into this. And so this thing walks up. I don't even know what's going on. And this thing communicates with me and says, I'm going to kill you. And I'm like, I think so. Like, I mean, yeah. And so as it's walking closer, I'm thinking, this is, you know, I've ticked off some god, obviously, up there, and then the first reaction was, hey, I ticked off Allah because I went to FCA. <laughs> Darn those blonde women, you know? I'm like, oh. And so then I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe it's not Allah. Maybe it's Jesus. He looks nothing like the pictures. <laughs> then I'm thinking, maybe it's something else. So as I'm thinking this, I'm freaking out because it's getting closer and closer. So at, at that point, I am praying to anybody up there. Allah, Buddha, Oprah, I don't care. Okay? <laughs> and so this thing gets closer and closer, reaches my bed, and I'm thinking, okay, see you later, world. And it disappears. Well, it was holding me. Let's go. And now I'm stunned, not paralyzed, just lying in my bed going, what the blank happened? And I run out of the room, wake up my brother, and I go, what did you do? What, 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 what is going on? And he was like, are you asleep? And I, I go, I don't think so. I, and so I tell him the story, and um, he confirms that there are demons. I didn't know that. I was like, what? See, I'd never read the Bible, so I just thought that the, that the, that the Bible was basically like the Quran, just stuff you're not supposed to do, but it's fun. You know, like that's it. And here he tells me about Jesus interacting with demons and like, oh, yeah, it's true. And I'm like, what the, what? And uh, I go, okay, okay, so, so what do we do? And, um, you know, he goes, okay, well, he starts telling me about salvation and, and the gospel and the things I've heard before. And he tells me the great analogies and all that. And as he's going through it, I'm like feeling this dread of like, I'm going to be, I'm going to die somehow. And I just say, you know what, just stop, just stop, bro. I need something, I need something bigger. I need, like, someone to help me fight off this big, ugly thing, okay? So I need some serious help. And he says this, I'll never forget it. He says, the only person I know who has authority over demons and angels is Jesus. And I go, all right, well, then let's do this. Let's just make the connection. Let's do whatever we have to do. Add him on Facebook. I don't know. Like, let's do it. Let's do it. And so we pray together, and uh, uh, he prays for me, and I pray. And my prayer is this. I mean, again, I was a Muslim like two minutes ago. So I'm like, I'm thinking, and I've never prayed really out loud in my own language. In, in Islam, you pray in Arabic on a mat. And so I just look up, and I go, you know what, Jesus, I don't know who you are, so I can't say I love you. I can't say you're the Lord of my life because I don't know who you are. But if you will help me from, with this, I'll give you my whole life. And so that was my sincere prayer. And then my brother prayed for me. It was beautiful. It was great. And, and I'm like, okay, amen, amen. I'm like, now what? Because I'm still scared to death. And so I kid you not. And you can ask him. He gives me the world's smallest Bible. It's a Gideon Bible. I didn't know what Gideon meant, but it's a green Bible. It's about this big. You guys know what I'm talking about. He's like, read John, I'll see you in the morning. And I'm like, I'm thinking, move over, I'm spooning you. Like, no, I'm not. I'm not going back in the room. Not happening. I'm not going back in the room. And he goes, no, you got to go back in the room. I'm like, no, I don't. And he's like, no, you just prayed to Jesus. You got to go back in the room. I'm like, I just met the dude. I don't even know his last name. You go back in the room. I'll stay here. And so he, he goes back and forth, back and forth. Who's going back in the room? And finally, I'm like, okay, I'll go back in the room. So I go back in the room, you know, hiding behind the Bible. And, and I, I sit there, and I'm freaking out because everything's making sounds. And, and, and I'm reading 
John, and I'm thinking, you know what, I'm a Muslim, man. I don't want any part of this. I just don't, I just, you know what, this, this I mean, what's going on? I don't want, I just, I, just, I just want God to leave me alone. Like, really, I just went through a war, and now I'm, I'm attacked by invisible dudes. I mean, can I have some real issues? Like, you know, people are going to think I'm crazy. What, what, what's going on? And so my frustration turns to anger. I put the Bible down. I go shut off the lights, come back to my bed, and I sit on my bed, look up, and I say, Jesus, if I die tonight, it is your fault. That's, what, that's all I, I my, my prayer life has gotten better, just so you guys know. <laughs> but I didn't know what else to do. So I pray that or say that, and then I put the covers over my head, and I'm hoping nothing else happens. But I'm thinking if something does happen, I'm just not going to open my eyes because I can control my eyes, and I don't want to see anything nasty. And so, in my, so I'm, I'm lying there, and then a couple minutes later, something is beginning to shake me. And I'm like, oh, no, round two. <laughs> and I'm hoping it's my brother. He wants to snuggle, but I don't think that's him. And so, so um, the, it's, I'm, I'm being shaken, and I'm like, okay, whatever happens, don't open your eyes. Don't open your eyes. Don't open your eyes. And the next second... I find myself sitting on my bed with my eyes open, staring into him. And um, he, um, he is intoxicating. Like, I have never felt the peace of God so aggressive. It felt like I was looking at him, but I was somehow inside of him. And he said, I am Jesus, and your life is not your own. And I remember just staring and into him and at him and thinking, I can't keep my eyes off of you, but I cannot keep my eyes open. It felt like I in this state was not meant to be in his presence. My body couldn't take it. And he just put me to sleep. The next morning I wake up and I've got this spiritual download. And I think I went to my brother and I was like, hey, so I'm supposed to be in ministry. I don't know what that means. <laughs> and that moment has shaped my life, but not just mine, not just his, but my sisters and my younger sister and my other brother. And God has pursued my whole family and now we're all followers of Jesus. Mom and dad are not yet. But it is amazing to me what God will do and how God will pursue us. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter where you came from. His love will not quit on you. And he will pursue you. If you're here this morning, the reason why you're here, I mean the real reason why you're here, is that there's something inside of you that's drawn to him. And your brain doesn't have language to communicate or process this, but your heart responds. And that's why you're here listening to this. And you need to be reminded that there's a God out there who pursues you with his love because he knows that the only thing, the only thing that can take you out of the person you are or you were and into the person you were created to be is his pursuing love for you. It is a very, very different kind of love. In fact, it is a love that is everlasting. Let me read you a couple of passages of scripture here. This is one of the scriptures that define God's love for us. Jeremiah 31, 3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing, unfailing kindness. You see, the, God's love is very different from the love that we experience or we express in the scriptures, God's love is explained as a perfect love. The Greek word is teleu. Actually, let's say that out loud. Anybody want to learn Greek? Okay. Teleu. One more time. Teleu. It's a teleu love. It's a perfected love. Here's the big difference. God's love does not evolve. It does not grow anymore. It cannot grow anymore. Your love and my love can grow. 
See, we're in relationships right now, and our love can grow. Our, my love for my wife will grow. My love for my kids will grow. My love for guacamole will grow. I know it will. You know, it just will. It will. I will love it even more and more and more. One day I'll wake up and I'm like, I love you more than I loved you 10 years ago. But God doesn't wake up and go, you know what? You know what? Call me crazy. I think I love you more. <laughs> no, it doesn't happen. And the reason why it does not happen is because our love is based on condition. Our love will grow based on a certain kind of performance. If a person in a relationship devalues the person, chances are the love is going to decay. It will either grow or it will decay. But God's love does not because it's not based on any condition. It's not like, you know what, if you did this, I would even love you more. Because God knows us completely and therefore he loves us completely. In fact, let me read you this passage of scripture. I want to jump to Jeremiah 1. Check this out. Jeremiah 1 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. What? I mean, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. What do you mean? You had a relationship with me before I existed? Who does that? Could it be possible that God has been dreaming about you before you were born? Could you imagine he was thinking in his imagination, I can see how so-and-so is going to become this kind of person. Yeah, I mean, isn't it baffling to even think that God could love you before you do anything else? I mean, that kind of love is ridiculous, isn't it? It basically gives us, it seems like gives us the freedom to do whatever. Or does it do something else for us? Maybe it does not give us the freedom to do whatever we want to. Maybe it empowers us to become the people we were created to be. And in fact, resists the temptation to become anything else. And if you don't believe me, check this out. God himself had to remind Jesus, Jesus, son of God, Jesus, of this very truth. So if you know anything about Jesus, you probably know that about 30 years old, he started his ministry. Okay, he started doing some things. And the first thing he pretty much did is he went to go get baptized. You remember that, anybody? So he gets baptized by John. John's there. Jesus shows up. Jesus like, I'm next. John's like, what? No way. Jesus like, yeah, way. No, no, I'm sorry. That was a bad joke, bad joke. Sorry. I had to say it. But he's like, yeah, you got to do it. You got to do it. So he gets baptized. Remember that? He gets baptized. He comes out of the water. And then there's like this epic scene, right? Like there's a dove, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. What? There's light smokes. Probably a rock band. I don't know who's playing. Maybe Justin Timberlake. I don't know. All I know is I missed the concert yesterday. Anyway, so... So it's a big scene, and then there's a voice. Anybody remember that? There's a voice that says something in particular. Let me read it to you if you don't remember. It says this. It's found in Luke chapter 3, verse 22. It says, and a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. The message tr translation says this, you are my son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. Now, what's confusing to me is Jesus hadn't done Jack. I mean, think about it. What did Jesus, Jesus do at that point? Get baptized. And he didn't even do that. John did. He gets out of the water. Did he walk on water? No. He didn't do anything. He just got up. And God, I, I mean, did, it, did God just kind of go overshoot this a little bit? He goes and tells Jesus, hey, hey, Jesus, you are my son, and you bring me great joy. God doesn't say to everybody else, hey, by the way, I don't know if you guys noticed, the reason why there's a dove on him, the reason why this just happened is because he is my son, and he's pretty amazing. God could have said anything. He could have said, this is the Messiah. Believe in him. God didn't say that. God said and spoke to Jesus. He told Jesus, this is not about everybody else. This is about between him, his father and son. And it's a very intimate moment. And God says, Jesus, hey, yo, 
you are my son and you bring me great joy. Before he did anything. I mean, there's no miracles. There's nothing. Wouldn't it be great, though, if our dad and moms would have done that? Hey, before you do anything, before you go prove yourself to the world or whatever, before you accomplish the things, before you can do the things you want to tweet about, let me just, let me just tell you. You are my son. You are my daughter. You bring me great joy. I didn't do anything. I know. I know. I just want, I just want to tell you you are my son, you bring me great joy. I mean, you think maybe God overshot it because right after that, right after that, Jesus goes to the desert and is tempted. If you know that, the temptation of Jesus is pretty intense. You would think that God would have waited, right? You go through temptation, you come out of the temptation, he's all good, he uses scripture, God gives him a high five, ka-ching, you're awesome. And then the voice says, This is my son. He's pretty amazing. Look what he just did. But maybe God knows something about us that even if you are half human or sort of human, you need to know before you do anything that you are unconditionally loved by God and you bring God joy. That when God looks at you and you don't believe it, I know you don't believe it, he looks at you and he smiles and he goes, I just love him. He hasn't done Jack. He's living in all kinds of horrible stuff. I know, but he's the pride of my life. Really? You're proud of that? Yes, I am proud of that because God knows this is that and he, he knew it with Jesus and he knows it with us that if we, he tells us beforehand Before we go through temptation, if we know and embrace and believe that God loves us so much that when we go into temptation, his love for us will empower us to resist the temptation to be anything less than we were created to be. That's why he tells Jesus before, I love you. I know you haven't done anything. You're the pride of my life. You bring me great joy. You're marked by my love. You are my obsession. I can't stop thinking about you. I know you haven't done anything. Jesus goes through temptation. What do you think he was thinking all the way? I better prove, my, I better prove myself. I gotta do this. Focus, Jesus, focus. Or was he thinking, I make God smile. Wow. God knows the only thing that can shape you, shape me, to become the person we were created to be is his unconditional tele you love, perfected everlasting love for us. So he pours it out on us. And if you're here this morning, you're thinking, I get that. I get that. It, it, it does something for me, but honestly, I don't believe it. I, don't, I can't believe that God would do that because, well, I'm, I'm, I'm in this situation right now and that I can't explain and I can't understand that if God loved me so much, why would he let me do this? Or why would he allow this to happen? I mean, name, God loves me and that's why I get this medical report. God loves me so much, his favor is on me. That's why my kids are not talking to me. God loves me so much and unemployment is messing me up and reshaping the man I'm supposed to be. It's messing me up. I didn't think it would, but it is. You're telling me that God loves me so much and his favor is all over me, but I keep failing in life. You're telling me that God still loves me and he loves me and his love is undying when I've been struggling with this sin again and again and again and again and again, you're telling me that I don't disgust God because I disgust myself. And you know what? 
To that, the only thing I can do is remind you of Romans. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. This is the message paraphrase translation. It says this. If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition, exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there, is there, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? He goes on. Do you think, do you think anyone is able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us. There is, there is, help me with this, out loud, out loud, there is what? Oh, I can't hear you. There is what? There is no way. Not doubt, not, not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even, not even the worst, what? Sins listed in scripture. And then he goes a little bit crazy here. He goes, I am absolutely convinced that what? Oh. Let's, let's just try this again. I am absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic today or tomorrow, high, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely what? can get between us and God's love because of, because of what? What? Because of the way that Jesus, our master, has done what? Embraced us. And he is not letting go. And so, I don't know where you are this morning, but I do know where you need to be. I think you need to be in his arms. I, need, I think you need to be, allow him to embrace you, to tell you, I know that everybody else has been waiting for you to get your act together, but I have known you before you were born. I know you feel like a disappointment to everyone, but you are the pride of my life. I know it feels like you've been marked with failure, but you are marked by my love. And I know you have upset and disappointed so many people, but you are the joy of my life. Could you imagine if you believed it? You're listening to this and there's something inside of you that says, oh God, yes, please. But just imagine if you moved from listening to actually believing it. You wouldn't need anybody to love you. You wouldn't need anybody to approve of you. You wouldn't need anybody to compete with. You wouldn't need to have anxiety of where you are in life. You would know that you are loved unconditionally, completely, and there is nothing you can do to make God love you more. And God chooses to never love you less because his love is everlasting. He draws you with unfailing kindness because he knows that love, his love, is the only thing that will set you free, that empower you. He knows that it is the strongest force humanity will ever experience. His undying love is the only thing that can take you out of the mess, take you out of the person you are right now and shape you into the person you were meant to be you were created to be. So my prayer is this. I pray that you allow him to embrace you. For some of us, you know what that means? It means, Jesus, if you are real, show me. For others of us, it means, you know what? I am committing my life 
to Christ. My life is not my own. I've played around with this. I've kind of kind of went back and forth. This is it. Today it is. And some of you guys are not in this room. You're in that room right there. And you have to pray and believe and invite him into your life. You need to do that today. And others of you, you need to just lean on God's love because the stuff you're going through is extremely hard and you cannot depend on other people's love and hope and other people's commitment to you. You have to lean on God's unfailing love for you. And I think some of you, some of you, you need to let him love you. You need to let him love you. No other love will shape you but his. None. No man's going to do it. No woman's going to do it. No kid is going to love you. Only his love shapes you into the person you were created to be. Let me pray for you. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for your undying love for us. This tele you love. It's a completed, unconditioned love that you poured out on humanity. And you've been able to do that because of what Jesus has done. He's made a way for us that we no longer have to use religion to prove that we love you because you sent Jesus as proof that you love us. And so, Lord God, I pray, would you allow us to embrace that, believe that, live in that, lean on it, trust it as we go through our lives, knowing, God, that as we abandon our lives to your love, you will empower us, you will transform us, you will move us into the person we were created to be. God, I pray that you speak to us even though we do not want to hear, that you allow us to see even though we do not want to, that you love us and you're in our lives and you're in our kids' lives and you're in our marriages, in our finances. You're there, you're there because nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing will make you stop loving us. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.